Johnson, who used a number of quotes by Mr John Armstrong about uh, the budget and projections for its, uh, for its future. Uh, well, at the same time, what Mr Robertson forgot to mention was that there were a number of economists uh, throughout New Zealand, actually more than a number, who actually believed that the budget was relatively conservative and that it was infinitely achievable. And the point that actually brings a lot of uh, impetus and merit to these other projections, like these other comments, was the uh, growth rates for the January through March period, the first quarter of this year, uh, Mr Speaker, where the forecasts were around 0.4 per cent growth for the economy. And what did we achieve? 0.8 per cent growth for that three-month period, double the forecast. And what's more, Mr Speaker, they went back and had a look at the, the uh, growth uh, figures for the period uh, October through to December and bumped those up as well. So on any measure, Mr Speaker, that would indicate that the projections we had for this budget are pretty conservative and on the mark. In fact, being supported now by, by data, actual data in our economy. Actual people, businesses getting out there, starting and growing new businesses, employing more people and actually paying more tax in this economy. And that, Mr Speaker, is a fantastic way to uh, continue on with this budget debate. Because actually, what those projections actually deliver upon, what, those actual, what that actual data delivers upon, is some of the key focuses of this budget. And that was to get New Zealand back into surplus by 2014 and 2015. And what happens when you get back into surplus, Mr Speaker? You actually don't have to uh, draw down the debt that you have currently needed to do when you're operating in deficit. It's a key function of the government to operate in surplus in, as, as we get back into better times. And I think that, underpinned by the data that we um, has been shown in the economy, is that we're moving definitely in the right direction. The second thing about the budget was that it, we actually based it on some pretty sound home ec some, um, ec principles of home economics. The first principle was spend less than you earn in the life of the long term. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> I know this is quite radical, isn't it? Yeah. Secondly, only borrow what you can afford to pay back. I know it's and another quite a radical policy, but another one that we put at the centre of the budget. You might need to explain this. Yeah, to and ultimately get yourself into a position where you can save and repay debt. Mr Speaker, these basic economic principles have been sharpened as we've watched Portugal, Ireland, Greece and Spain struggle with debt mountains that seem to them, I'm sure, insurmountable. And just in the last few weeks, We've watched as the mighty United States has battled with its debt trillions and has been forced to curb its government spending. Simple economics once again. If you spend more than you earn over the long term, eventually you get yourself into a pile of muck. And that's what these countries are doing. We, on the other hand, took a very conservative approach when we came into office in 2008. And we had a look at where we needed to be. We were presented with forecasts these were in the pre-fu, before the election, and then in the high fu, the half-yearly fiscal update following the election, where this Labor government of that period left us with projections for deficits over the next 10 years. Deficit after deficit after deficit. And what that means, if we go back to our simple home economics example is that that means you've got a projection of debt never coming and never and, and, and continuing to rise and never coming down. That was what we were left with, Mr Speaker. So I'm, I'm proud to be part of this government, sure. proud to be part of a John Key-led government who's been realistic about the issues that we have faced and has put the policies in place to make sure that we could go forward as a nation and be, quite frankly, in the position we are now. While other nations around the world are f faced with huge cuts to their budgets, riots in the streets as citizens come to the realism that actually uh, they do have to make a profit in the long term and come to the reality that they have to live within their means. I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, pretty basic stuff, but that is what is happening. Now, I'll ask members of the House, and even in the opposition, are we seeing riots in the streets in New Zealand? No, we're not.
No, we're not. It's because we are in a great position going forward in excellent shape. New Zealand, Mr Speaker, is in a different position to many of these other nations. Our total debt is comparable, but where we differ is in the proportion that is owed by government versus that owned by, the, by private citizens. Net government debt in New Zealand is about a quarter of our total national debt. Now that's fantastic. We are in a great position, and that debt trap came back down from, I mean, we go back to the 1970s when Muldoon was in, in, in government, we had a debt to GDP of about 70 per cent. That was high. But over progressive governments, including the national government through the 90s, that was where the biggest dip in the uh, debt curve came, came back, and through the Labor government in the last nine years, debt to GDP came back. Where the smoke and mirrors is, Mr Speaker, is that the Labor government actually claimed that they repaid debt. Right? The reality is that the economy grew significantly. They didn't pay down a cent, but debt to, to GDP fell as the economy grew. That's the facts of the matter, Mr Speaker. That is the facts of the matter. We, we have... Oh, mate, you go and have a look. The, the financial wizards over the other side of the house there. You have a look at the debt position that you inherited and what it was at the end. Didn't change at all. The economy grew and debt to GDP fell. That's the reality of it. So stop, stop trying to tell the New Zealand public that you repaid debt. It's bollocks. <laughs> A point of order, Ian Lee Scalloway. Mr. Speaker, I think that the, the speaker on his feet has made a lot of uh, no order. That's not a point of order. The member will sit down. Sit doing. down. It's not a point of order. Chris Tremaine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, look, going forward, this budget uh, reinforces the six-point plan that we have been driving right from the start uh, of uh, being in government. That six-point plan is, a, is totally a focus on taxation and, and uh, changing the taxation. You've seen us. Uh, make a big difference there, the switching and changing the incentives so that people who are, uh, want to get out there and work, if you're earning under $48,000 now, Mr Speaker, you'll pay no more than 17.5 cents in the dollar. Under any tax level compared to that side of the House when they are government, people pay less tax in this country to go out and work. It's a fantastic situation that we have delivered, uh, Mr Speaker. The second part of the plan has been an infrastructure where we've invested significantly in infrastructure. And I'm proud to see uh, the rollout of high-speed internet through, through fibre being laid into the ground. In fact, I was at a meeting in Hawke's Bay uh, on Monday where Unison, who didn't actually get the contract with the government, but who are, going, who are comp out there at the competitive uh, fibre network, and we're going to end up with a wonderful fibre network in, in Hawke's Bay, which is absolutely, absolutely magic. And trade and innovation. We are, uh, that's the third part of our plan out there, uh, taking, just organising new free trade agreements with uh, India. Uh, that's going to be a wonderful opportunity, giving more markets to our, our, um, uh, to our, to our traders, and particularly uh, locally in Hawke's Bay. Fantastic to see that move. The work that we've done getting apples into Australia, and I think very, within the very short space of time we're actually going to see the first shipment of apples into Australia. Uh, Skills and education has been a major focus for us, the fourth part of our, our plan. Um, that has been a huge uh, focus for us, particularly with national standards and delivering upon those. And this budget delivers uh, additional, an additional fo focus on, that, on those particular standards, making sure that we deliver those going forward and, uh, and lift, lift up the competence of children within our, our school system. The fifth area there is of the part of the plan is government spending and services, where we've had a major focus, keeping a lid on, on government spending and keeping, uh, keeping a real focus on driving efficiencies in our government departments. And as uh, Bill English um, mentioned earlier uh, in the speech tonight, he's, he made a compliment to many of the CEOs of those government departments who are making a real difference out there in, in delivering better services for the same level of money. And to say that we've gutted government services is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, take, take health, health and education where there have been budget education. We are now delivering more operations than at any time under that government. More operations than at any time under that government. What they struggle to understand is that you actually can be efficient 
that you can be more productive and that you can deliver more services with the same budget. And I think that's uh, a talent that Bill English has brought, a focus that he's brought, and which is making a huge difference in this country. Um, Mr Speaker, I'll finish my speech there. We've got a strong focus on building a strong, uh, uh, excellent economy. And